really, you have a destination, you want to go to college, but you have no navigation. I went to a college fair in Chicago as a high school senior, and it was at McCormick Place. And I talk about this in the book as well. For those of you who came in late, this is the book that I'm talking about. For those of you who came in on time, I didn't hold it up. This is the book that I'm talking about. Um, so I go to McCormick Place in Chicago, and it's like a thousand colleges represented. They're all over the place. I don't know anything about college. I don't know college terminology. I've never heard of HBCU, liberal arts, or private. So I go there, and I'm walking around. I'm looking lost. You know, have you ever, you know, you can recognize people when they look like they're lost? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm walking around looking lost. And there's only one black guy. And there's one thing growing up. If you grow up in Chicago in poverty where everybody's black, and, you know, as you go through life, you know, you see a brother. See, I live in Atlanta. Now, you know, in Atlanta, it's, it's something. You go you, in Atlanta walking down the street, here comes a black guy. Now, you all don't know each other. But are like, yo, what up? <laughs> you know? so, so I'm walking to a coffee place, and he saw me. He said, hey, what up? I said, you talking to me? He said, yeah, man, come here. You going to college? He said, yeah. <laughs> you know what college you going to? I said, I don't know, man. You got a big one? <laughs> he said, what are you going to study? I said, what? You got to decide what you're going to study? I mean, because uh, in elementary school, they ask, ask you what you want to study in elementary school, right? Yeah, right. Middle school, they say, choose, choose a major in middle school. No. Before magnet programs in high school, you just went to a comprehensive, comprehensive high school. You didn't have a choice of class. You didn't have a choice of anything. So I'm going to college. That's all I know. I'm going to college. And then he said, well, at Northeastern. He said, what do you like? And I said, well, I want to build stuff. I want to build rockets. He said, no, he said, one of the best engineering programs in the country. And he said, you can work your way through. We have the largest cooperative education program in the country. So you go to school half the year, work half the year, make enough money to pay your way through. And I was hooked. He gave me an application <laughs> fee waiver, a bumper sticker that said Northeastern University, <laughs> an application, and a little husky. That was the mascot for Northeastern. I went back to my high school when nobody graduated, let alone went to college. I dared not tell anybody that I had the application. I didn't even tell my parents. I took it to school, talked to the counselor, got my transcript, I put it in the mail. I thought if you apply to college, you automatically get in. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know there was a, such a thing as college admissions and acceptance. I thought, man, I, I put that thing in the mail, I was sitting right at home there. <laughs> When I get in, when I get in, when I get in. And I got it a letter back, and it was a conditional acceptance. Because in my high school, they didn't offer physics, they didn't offer calculus, and it, the letter said, you've been accepted into the engineering program at Northeastern University, conditional on your passing classes in physics and calculus. It was very different. You know, today, colleges, you know, they need the money. <laughs> they look, we'll get, you can get in. You may not make it through, but you know what? We're going to let you in. You may take that class five times. Roll up. You can tally up that tuition five times. But they said, no. You got to take it. So I went to community college, and I took physics and calculus. i tell you how motivated I was. The idea of getting out of poverty, leaving Chicago, going to college. I worked at the post office from 9.30 p.m. to 2.30 a.m. I got back home at 3.30 a.m. I went to bed and I got back up at 6.30 a.m. I got on a bus to go out to Kennedy King Junior College to be in class by 8 a.m. I was in those two classes almost all day in the physics lab and in the calculus class. When I went back home, I ate and I did homework. I went back to the post office. Talking about motivated, I could man, I was, uh, I was motivated. I passed the classes. Went to Northeastern in January of uh, 1975. And for the first time in my life, I could really start to see the end. I could see the horizon. I could see the potential. Because when I got to Northeastern, I could see that, man, there's a blight outside of Chicago. My dorm room at Northeastern was better than how I grew up in Chicago. Uh, I had more room in my dorm room, which was a lousy dorm room, but it was all mine. It had no roaches, it had no mice. Um, it was, and then the meal program at Northeast. You can eat all you want, all day long if you want, whatever you want. You know, I, there was no more waiting on Christmas for you know a uh, uh, a fruit cake, waiting on my birthday for a pound cake. 
Man, I get like apple pie every day. <laughs> every chocolate cake every day. I know why people put on weight in college, because man, I was I was eating like they were gonna take it back. <laughs> so so I went Eastern, I, I went through the program there and I graduated and and this was my, my best buddy uh, uh, at Northeastern. And for this day, it was the first time my father had ever been on an airplane, first time he had ever been uh, further, he, he had ever been out, outside Chicago except to go to Memphis. And my mother, first time she had ever been on an airplane, and they sat there, and they were so proud. So what I've tried to communicate in the book, and it really is a story for everyone, is that life, you don't know what life, where life can lead you but you know you got to get up every day and you got to go. I like one, Tavis Miley <laughs> stole an African proverb, and he acknowledged these stories. Uh, we talked about the, and some of you may have heard about the story about the gazelle and the lion. You know that every morning in the savannah, the, uh, the gazelle gets up running because the gazelle knows if he is not as fast as the fastest lion that he'll be eaten. And the lion gets up running because he knows that if he is not as fast as the slowest gazelle, he'll starve. So it doesn't matter if you're a gazelle or a lion, you got to get up running. <laughs> and so, and so it's, what this part of my journey really taught me was, one, I could be smarter than I ever thought I could be. Two, I could work harder than I ever thought I could be. Uh, three, that the basic nature of people is that we're lazy. Uh, so we never know how much we can give. Um, and so what I try to do as a good friend and as a parent is I try not to excuse laziness. And I try to do it in a very kind way, so I'm always asking questions. You know, like, did you really study as, as hard as you could have for that test that you took? This is my little, my little quiz. Let me see a little show of hands. Have any of you had any tests this year that you just didn't study as hard as you could have? Raise your hand. Have any of you had any papers that you had to do? You put other things ahead of that paper and you just didn't get it done the way it could have been done? Uh, any of you ever, you know, look at life and use that as an excuse as to why you didn't do the best that you could have done? Well, you know, there was traffic or, you know, my family. They just, oh, how many of you have children? Oh, man, that's the best excuse. You know, if I had had these children, man, I could be a serious student. I mean, I could really do what I need to do if it wasn't for these dang kids. How many of you remember back before you had kids? If I had that boyfriend always in my way, on my nerve, being a distraction, or before you had a boyfriend, if it wasn't for my friend always calling me up when I need to be studying, you know, and then before you had friends, if my mother just didn't cause all this drama in our household, that I could get what I needed to get done, or before, you know, all of that happened, go back to the two. If I wasn't so short and I could just reach more things, I could get more. That's, that's our nature. And what I've tried to do, what I've tried to do in my own life, is just not excuse why I'm You know, um, and just say, I'm not doing what I should be doing. I could do it. And whenever I say that, that's the voice that I need. And this is just for me. That's the voice that I need for me. And so that's what it taught me. See, here's the other thing um, about for my children. And I don't know what you want for your own children, but this is what my journey taught me about my children. I am as best as I can trying to orchestrate my children going away to college. Because I believe, from my own journey, that going away being on your own is forging a different type of person than if you have somebody to leave. Uh, for me being at college, there were several times when I wanted to leave, I wanted to go home, but I stayed. That taught me how to stand on my own. Uh, and also, college is a reasonably safe environment. Um, I know at Northeastern, I was never, it, here's, here's another thing too, and this again is part of my journey. At Northeastern, I was never afraid of the lights being turned on. <laughs> I was never afraid of there not being hot water. I was never afraid of running out of beans. Uh, and no, I was never afraid of a gang shooting me. Uh, there were, I guess I reached a point to where there was so much calm in my life 
the only the only the only real uh, uh, stress <laughs> was every registration day because my financial aid was always messed up. You know what that taught me? My best friend was the director of financial aid. I had a cell phone number. Well, she didn't have a cell phone. Then. Had a home number. Had an office number. Had an address. And every time it was time to register, she saw my pitiful face sitting in the same seat. She said, Michael, when? You here again? Yes, ma'am. You didn't fill out your paperwork? No, ma'am. Didn't your parents fill out? My daddy can't even, my dad didn't even know how to read this, Miss, Miss, Miss uh, Whiting. She said, come on into my office. Don't do it again. <laughs> no, this is all the quarter system. I did that every single quarter <laughs> that I was in school. But you know what that taught me? It taught me not to give up. It taught me to go in and find someone who would help you. Because there are a lot of good people in the world if you just ask them for hand. So, that, so, I, so all of that was part of that journey. This is uh, uh, something I talk about in the book that uh, for me is also is significant in terms of our gifts and our talents. I started writing when I was in the second grade. I was a low student, a low performing student. I was an awful student. As a matter of fact, my second grade teacher told my mother she didn't think I would make it out of elementary school. But I started writing, and it was with poetry. You know, because in Chicago, growing up, you know, the way you really, you know, earned your rights in the, in the neighborhood is that you had to hear talk about people. You know, roses are red, violets are blue, your dog is ugly, you are too. You know, you had to come up with some nice little lyrics, nice little words. That preceded rap as we know it today. So I was writing poetry. I went to college for engineering, but after graduating from college, working at IBM, two years into my job at IBM, I quit, and I called my mama, and I told her that I quit. And she said, and she was in Memphis, I said, Mama, I had on the phone. I was proud, too. It didn't come out right, because I was proud. I said, Mama, I quit my job. And that was a long pause. I thought she had had a heart attack. I said, Mama, you still there? Said, and finally, after a long pause, she said, Son, why? I said, Mama, I don't want to be no engineer. I want to be a writer. And she said, Fool, couldn't you keep your job and write too? <laughs> <laughs> but, but <laughs> the issue for me, and this is my journey, the issue for me is I got to give 110% to whatever it is that I'm doing. And, and I couldn't. And I was too immature. Joseph and I were talking about the immaturity of young men. And right out of college two years, I was too immature. But, but also, I didn't have a family, I didn't have mouths to feed, so I quit my job in San Jose. I went to L.A., I printed my poetry on posters and note cards, I went out to Venice Beach, put up my little table, had my stuff, I was a writer. I was broke, but I was a writer. Um, here's the other thing about a college education. It really gives you a level of thinking that allows you to process and to plan. And although I was impulsive as I left IBM, once I realized that I didn't have any money, started coming up with plans, started building allegiances, alliances, partnerships. I went to a printer, got a printer to donate to printing until I got started. Met another printer, met an artist, got the artist to donate calligraphy until I got going. And I, I started, I started building. And then eventually, years later, I met my wife. And I realized, okay, now that I'm about to have a family, I really need to get a job. So I went back, but I went back with a plan. Went back to work at Transamerica in Los Angeles uh, with a five-year plan. It took five years of Transamerica to become fully vested in the stock plan. I said, I'm going to work. I'm going to commit to five years. And then at the end of five years, I'm quitting. I'm going to take all my stocks. I'm going to go back and start this publishing company. And, and that was my plan. This was, uh, you know, and I write about everything. Uh, because whatever's in my spirit, in my heart, when I find time to write, I write about college planning, poetry. That was my first book, Raising Black Boys. I got two sons, and, you know, my, my faith. And so that's uh, then the Follow Your Dream is, uh, is one of them. So really, here's the message. Here is the message. Uh, dream big. Yeah. What do you think about this one? Um, and in fact, this is what I like. We, we got now. I want to get a sense of where I was going to be and how much time I got. This, this is going to be Time for your voice. Here's what we're going to do. I want you to focus a moment on maybe a dream that you have for your own life that you share with someone 
whom you wanted to hear a word of encouragement, and you got something else. Just think about that. That's happened to you. Because most of us, it's happened to. Sometimes it's just with one of our good friends. Other times it's with our parents. I mean, parents. Oh my lord, parents sometimes are brutal. Mama, I want to go on. I want to start that little, that little, that little cookie. Oh, here it is. I want to start a coffee shop. This is before Starbucks. I want to start a coffee shop. My mama has some specialty coffees, and I know people that need some caffeine to pick me up. And then your mother said, nobody drinks coffee. What's wrong with you? You can't make any money doing that. Pay what, 50 cents for a cup of coffee? How are you going to, how are you going to, I want you to think about it. Have you had that in your journey where you had something you really wanted to do? Maybe you're doing it now, or maybe you put it aside for a while. But you shared it with someone, and it was just like a slap in the face. I mean, not that they intended it to be that way. Because, you know, many of our friends, what they say to us is well-intentioned. They try to get us to think through it, right? But, you know, when it's your dream, that's not what you want to hear. You want to hear somebody that's like, you know, a personal coach. Go for that. Man, if that is your dream, focus on what you want to do. And build yourself a group of people to work with you. and Do it. Focus. Or what about maybe it was just going back to school? Because many of you all have returned to school, right? So maybe it was that voice. You told someone, maybe at the job, I think I'm going back to school. At your age. <laughs> <laughs> you sure you want to do that? Or someone say, you got kids in school. Who the hell is doing their homework if you're going to school? Uh, I want you to think about that for a moment. Then we'll go around the room. We'll see, see what you all got. Now, I just want to say, when I decided to come that I wanted to find a job working at the college, that I wanted to teach at the college level. I had about eight years in at the county, and people like, you can retire in 12 years. Why would you go work at the college? You know, why would you go do anything else? And so what I found is that when you want to do something, you just have to go do it, and you can't go along with the, the naysayers because people will be discouraging but then you have to look at who's discouraging you and see if they're following their dream, mm -hmm. you know, because oftentimes they don't believe it can work because they haven't tried to implement it in their lives. And so, yes, everybody at the, at the county that I used to work for, work with, is pretty much retired now, but that's okay because I'm happy doing what I do, and I no longer feel like I work. I just go do what I do. Anyone else? Let me say this to those of you who, who don't have a story to share. And this young man, I think, is a good example uh, of sharing your story. When you start, when you reach a point where you have the courage to share your dreams with people you don't even know, you'll start getting information that otherwise you would never get. There's someone in the room that knows something about something about something. Someone else in the room knows someone that knows someone about something. Someone else, I mean, it, and, for, and for me and, and the things that I've done, and that's how Dr. McCord and I met, is that she saw me doing what I'm trying to do. And she embraced me and she encouraged me. And then as I looked throughout the country, and, and I just said, she, she said, I have just returned from Bermuda. I've been working in Bermuda now for 12 years. I've been, I've had a contract with the middle schools, first through the Ministry of Education, then with the middle schools, now with a private foundation. And I met some of the best friends who have just encouraged me and embraced my work. And that enabled my work to just grow and to reach another level. 